Have you been thinking about starting a podcast as a financial brand leader? Now, what might this journey look like? How could this play into helping you build and develop and expand both your personal brand as well as your influence in the communities that you're serving? More importantly, what self-limiting beliefs might you have right now in this very moment that could be holding you back from even beginning this journey in the first place? And as a result, you're losing millions, if not tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in future loans and deposits because you're failing to take action. We're going to talk through these questions and more on today's episode of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. You're listening to the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. Welcome back to the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. I'm James Robert Lay, founder and CEO of the Digital Growth Institute, where we help financial brands uncover and eliminate customer journey blind spots so that they stop losing loans and deposits. Now, before we get into today's episode, I want to invite you to be one of 100 financial brands that I'm guiding in 2025 through the Digital Growth Accelerator. I want to be very clear, though. The 2025 Digital Growth Accelerator program is only it is only for growth-minded financial brand marketing, sales, and leadership teams who want to thrive and not just survive in 2025. So if this sounds like you, if this sounds like your team, text me right now. My cell phone is 832-549-5792. Text me and let's just have a conversation. In fact, I've already had a few conversations with podcast listeners since we launched the accelerators since we opened up registration for the accelerator a week or so ago. And they've been good conversations, so good that they have committed to join the accelerator with their team because they want to learn, they want to grow, they want to level up together. Now, joining me for today's conversation is Ray Drew, aka SBA Ray. Ray is the SBA Managing Director at True Lion Federal Credit Union, as well as host of the number one podcast in SBA Lending. Welcome to the show, Ray. It is so good to share time with you today, buddy. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And before we get too far into your story, your journey of personal branding, of content, of podcasting, as an SBA lender, what has been going well for you? What's positive in your life right now, personally or professionally? It's your, your pick to get started on a positive note. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, and it's funny, we were just talking a little bit before this and SBA lending did not come up. We have so many different things going on, um, which, you know, SBA is my, yeah, it's, it's my one thing I've been doing since uh, college, really, the last 13 years. And that's going really well. Um, I mean, we just were in the news today in our, trade publication for becoming the number one credit union in the SBA space. So I just saw that come out today and everyone was hitting me up. So that was definitely a positive. 13 years. It's the thing you've been doing since college. What got you into this journey to begin with in the first place coming out of college? Did an internship, marketing internship, happened to be at an SBA company doing 504 loans. Um, did that internship, graduated since 2011. Um, they ended up about a month later, um, offering me a full-time job, just pounding the phones. So just trying to call a hundred commercial real estate brokers a day. That was pretty much my role. Uh, and it was, you know, a little bit of a tough time in the economy at that point, 2011, 2012, but, um, the company I worked for, um, was just great. It was 2025 kind of person company all in the office, felt like a family. And, uh, that really, uh, got me to really like what I was doing. And so the rest, uh, I guess, was history. <laughs> I mean, you, you've got some perspective now. Just think about the context of time, 13 years, 2011 now to 2024, going to 2025. What, what has changed maybe for you or what have you seen change most when it comes to marketing sales growth, specifically through the lens of we'll just say SBA commercial, that side of the house at a financial brand. What's changed most from your, your point of view? 
Well, it's funny because when I started out, the company I was at was called Mercantile Capital, and it was head up by again, I'm Chris Hearn, who is still you know in the SBA world today, and he was he was the innovator, he was the marketing guru, literally that's what they called him and stuff like that. So um, I actually came you know came up through that type of environment where it was a little different. They were doing things a little different. It was quote unquote an internet company. Um, we did national advertising from Orlando, Florida, and did lending nationwide. So, uh, you know, on the phones every day, I was talking to people, and this was just in 2011, um, not that long ago, but in our industry, you know, it's just things move so slow. And so for our industry, it was like we were on the cutting edge of the internet in 2011, and people were calling in, but they didn't fully trust that idea that you can get a loan by calling a number, you know, and especially a big commercial real estate loan for your business. And so I was on the phone all day battling that. The other thing I was battling was just the um, reputation of the SBA. Everyone thought it took six months. uh, And in many cases, it did at that time, depending on who kind of you worked with. But um, those are the big things that stand out in addition to like, we were still getting physical packages mailed to us at that point. Um, fast forward to today, no one cares where you are. No one cares who you are. Um, they just want to know if they're approved and, you know, when can we close type of thing. And so the education that's taken place over the last decade has been just like crazy. It, I mean, the, the people coming to me now, they don't think it takes six months. They think it should take two weeks, you know, shout out Jeff Bezos, um, you know, for changing the game on expectations on timing, but it still takes about two months. So now I'm, I'm, I'm talking on the other side. I'm saying, no, we can't do it. We can't close next week. You know, we just got this deal today and yada, yada, yada. Um, so yeah, everything's changed a lot. That's super interesting. Like the idea of expectation, expectation setting, it's something that I've been talking about for the better part of two decades and how expectations within financial services are being set by external experiences to your point shout out jeff bezos jay bear um who's been on the podcast a couple of times do you know jay by any chance in his Mm -hmm. his writing his thinking um jay's a, a great thinker on the digital side spoken with him at a couple of events And um, he's done some new research on how speed is correlated with trust. And if we're not setting the right expectations, we could be leaving opportunity on the table. Expectations comes down to what? One thing, it's, it's communication. And I think that's where what you're doing today, I'm very fascinated with, I'm very interested in, and, and I'm grateful for Paul Long, who's also been a guest on this podcast for introducing us because your communication, I mean, when you showed up, you were communicating something vastly different than what a lot of people communicate when they show up for this podcast. It's even just your visual presence. It's your visual communication. So if you're not watching this, if you're listening to this, go over to the YouTube channel, Digital Growth Institute, and, and take a look at how Ray is communicating without even saying a word. It's his studio. What was the shift that inspired you to go down, I would say, a different path than what a lot of financial brand leaders, regardless of if they're on the commercial side, the retail side, the mortgage side, what inspired you to go down this path here? You know, when I was young and and doing this first couple of years, I was just soaking things up like a sponge. And there were some things that ended up going into these corners of my brain that I forgot about the day I heard them. But years later, it's funny, I actually found a clip of a event that I was at. It was like a three minute clip of an event that my boss actually was putting on at the time. And it was taken on like a blurry Thing. It wasn't it wasn't like centered. It was like almost like a view of this the corner of the ceiling, but you can hear what was saying. And it was almost like word for word exactly the 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 map I kind of plotted out for myself without knowing I was following that exact advice, which was to 
provide value up front. Uh, give away your secrets for free. Don't worry about giving it away. Only 10% or less of the people are actually going to do what you're saying. So, and, and then, so eight years later, I created a podcast that gave all my competitors, all my secret, secret, you know, edges and all my advice. So I didn't really know I was doing that, but I was just absorbing stuff like a sponge back then. And so it kind of just was innate to me. So when I, when I went out on my own as a BDO, where you go out a business development officer, you know, that's what we call them in, in the SBA space where you're going out to the market with a laptop and a cell phone, and you've got to make it. The first thing I did was create an email newsletter. This is 2013. You know, the bank was like, no, you can't send emails. That's crazy. So, um, I technically got my bosses off the record approval to do it anyway, you know, and I started creating these emails that were just so effective because I was writing, I was like really paying attention to the subject line and the copy and all this stuff kind of came naturally to me, but I would get to a point where if I needed a deal, I would send an email to my database and I would just know like with the utmost, utmost confidence that I would get a deal you know, as a response to that email blast. And that was so different than what our bosses were saying to do, which was to go to the chamber event and to find 10 good referral sources um, and and try to take them out to lunch and dinners and and cultivate those relationships, which is fine. And that, that works for sure for some, but I went a totally different approach where I have thousands and thousands of people in my database And I use content to just stay in front of them at all times. We can't gloss over this point because it's something that I've talked about on the podcast. You're practically applying this. You've hacked time. It took time to build up that level of a database 2013 to now. So that's 11 years if I'm doing my math correctly. Mm -hmm. But over that period of time, you were placing deposits into the trust fund of people who you had captured their attention by providing value to them. And as a result, your investment of time over time is now paying a multiple. You need a deal. You send the email. You get the deal. Whereas to go out. Nothing wrong, chambers of commerce, centers of influence. It's relationship building, but in a different way compared to the relationships that you're building through content, crafting messages, communication. What, and I want to go back to, you got the off for record approval to start the newsletter. Why, why is this such a, a different way of thinking? It's a different way of doing maybe back in 2013. Is it still that, is there still that cultural nuance of we're going to do it the way we've always done it? Cause it's all we've done. It's all we've known and anything outside of that, it's scary. Change is hard. Um, I don't want to learn anything new. Or is there a tide shifting? Go back to just set the context of 2013. And why was there resistance there to begin with in the first place? Well, I, I honestly think it is mostly a compliance thing. Um, I struggled with this myself. I'm, look, I'm not a banking compliance expert. All I know is the bank hires the BDO to go out and develop business. How they do that is by creating a message and delivering that message to the right audience. Mm-hmm. So for them, if you go in front of a group of people and deliver that message, and of course, you know, anyone could be recording you these days and that can go on the internet and everyone can hear it. And, and so you, that type of thinking um, is the conventional type of thinking. Go, go have, go talk, give this message in person. I, I just said, you know, why I can give this to a lot of more people. Um, I don't have to leave my house. Um, you know, I don't have to buy anyone lunch and the people looking for that message are just going to come to me. And yet it's recorded and it's on the internet. And that's, I think where the uncomfortable thing is, what is he going to say? You know, well, 
if you're hiring someone and you trust them to go do the job and you trust them to go speak to people and bring in business and represent the bank, then I feel like today in, in this environment of content, you have to trust them to not say something stupid on the internet. But I think that's where there's a big disconnect. That's fascinating because I remember 2009, 2010, 2011, going to speak at different conferences and events within the industry. The big topic back then was social media. And it's like, well, what if they say something wrong? And back to your point about trust, like we are in the vertical where trust is the currency and trust can take months, years to get to the point to where it changes the behavior. It could take minutes as we saw with some of the bank crisis over the past couple of years, particularly with the, uh, uh, the Twitter <laughs> debacle, um, with, with, uh, SVB, how quickly that trust can be depleted and it's all communication. It's just the way that we connect and communicate that continues to transform over time. And so flash forward to where you're at today. Talk to me about the, the brand. Cause it just rolls off the tongue. SBA Ray. What was the impetus for that? Well, that one does roll off the tongue. Um, and, you know, trust is the perfect word because the trust is you, the trust is all the way around. The trust is with the borrower, our client. The trust is sort of it's like the content is almost like, for lack of a better word, a lubricant, I'm going to say, <laughs> Because they are watching your content and they trust you before you even speak to them to, for the first time. So when you do get somebody, I mean, the content, it's a weird thing, honestly. I get so many calls. So I have kind of like two channels. I have the Art of SBA Lending, which is for the small business lending community. The SBA lenders tune into that every week to hear interviews and things we're doing there. And then on the flip side, SBA Ray is a YouTube channel I created to give small business owners credible advice from an actual SBA lender. And it's two different audiences, but both of them, I've seen just so, such fascinating results. Like on the SBA Ray side, um, SBA Ray, like it just rolled off, it, you know, we're just brainstorming and that one just kind of worked. So I went with SBA Ray, um, ended up being really good for SEO purposes too. I, I'm ranking really high on YouTube and I'm getting every single day, multiple people coming to me from that channel. And they, they trust me. They're just like, I just want to work with you. They don't even know I work at True Lion. You know, they don't know, they don't care where I work. Um, on the other side, I get people in the SBA lending community working at my competitors that call me for advice, career advice all the time. And I'm happy to give it to them. I, I answer all of those calls. And, you know, it's it's just a crazy thing with trust is a perfect word for that. Um, content helps you build trust with all of the people around you. Isn't it interesting? Because by the time that someone reaches out and has the conversation with you, you feel like they already know you, but you don't really know them. So it, at least from my experience, it, it almost requires more intention on my part to be very curious about them because I've, I don't know anything. So it's like, I want to ask the questions, but they're, they're talking to me like they've known me forever. And in some cases they have because they've been watching and listening, commenting, engaging. And it is a bit of a mental mindset shift. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the conversation with Ray, but I wanted to take a minute to tell you about the 2025 Digital Growth Accelerator program that we've launched exclusively for growth-minded financial brand marketing sales and leadership teams who want to thrive and not just survive in 2025. So if this sounds like you, text me right now, 832-549-5792, because when you join the 2025 Digital Growth Accelerator program, you and your team are going to get a few things that will really transform your growth going forward into the future. Number one, you're going to get a customer journey assessment and website secret shopping study that shows you where you have blind spots in your customer journey, costing you millions of dollars in loans and deposits. Number two, you're going to get access, unlimited access to all 12 classes in the Digital Growth University so that together you can confidently develop a growth strategy that provides a clear path towards the future. And finally, 
you're going to get ongoing learning and development through quarterly customer journey masterclass workshops where I'm going to show you exactly what you need to do next to eliminate common customer journey blind spots so that you can continue to level up your loan and deposit growth every 90 days. Even better, you can join 100% risk-free because I understand I've been working in financial services for over two decades and I understand risk aversion for financial brand leaders. So what does that mean? It means that you can have your money back that if by the end of 2025, you don't gain at least a dozen new ideas that can help you build your brand while at the same time eliminating customer journey blind spots so that you level up your loan and deposit growth. Put it another way, what are you risking by not joining the Digital Growth Accelerator? How many more loans, how many more deposits will you risk losing because you probably have unseen gaps. You probably have blind spots in your customer journeys that you're not aware of right now. Now, here's the best part. When you take action to apply what you learn in the Digital Growth Accelerator, you're going to make the investment that you're making in yourself, the investment that you're making in your team, you're going to make that investment back when you acquire just three to five new accounts. So, if you are ready to thrive and not just survive in 2025, text me right now, 832-549-5792. Let's have a quick conversation. And with that, let's get back to the conversation with Ray. And, and I liked how you distinguished, you've got the art of SBA lending, which is for the SBA community. So you're creating value there. You've got SBA Ray for the, maybe the small business entrepreneur. Let's let's break each one of those up into its distinct components. Which came first in your own journey from developing and executing content to establish and expand trust against? The art of SBA lending came first. I did that in 2019. Um, basically looking as a BDO who had just come off a couple good years. Um I wanted to get even better. And, you know, if you're the top producer in your shop, you can't, there's no one else you can call within your, you know, institution. Um, so I started Googling it and going on YouTube and, you know, we're in a very niche industry. S it lending is probably 15, 20,000 people in the industry and maybe 2000 of them are BDOs and maybe 5% or less were doing more production than me. So I realized, oh, I'm the guy that has to make the content because it didn't exist. So I ended up making a podcast for it's evolved over the years, but essentially the first like 40 episodes was just me talking to a microphone, um, giving, you know, just trying to communicate an idea about how something that's worked for me that other BDOs, i.e. my competitors, um, could use to get better themselves. And that's kind of where it started. And obviously it's evolved since then. It's been about five years and, and we've been going, the other stuff came along the way. I think that's an important point to expand on. You got started, but it's evolved. Someone I was being interviewed on someone else's podcast a week or two ago. And they're like, well, what was your plan? Like, what was your plan? When you, I was like, I didn't have a plan. I just, I got started. Like I just, for me, I was publishing my first book. COVID shut the world down in March of 2020 supposed to publish and go on a book tour in April, 2020. And it's like, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade or you make a lemon martini. It's how you handle it. I complained for about a week, you know, I fell into the gap. We were talking about books, um, gap in the game by, uh, Dan and, and Ben. And then after about a week or so, my wife was like, shut up, go figure something out. And that's what was the impetus for launching this podcast. And here we are, we're pushing 500 episodes over the past four years, and it has evolved. Talk about the evolution with your content, with your podcast even, and let's just stay on the art of SBA lending because you started out with the newsletter back in 2013, entered into the podcasting world in 2019, because you felt like you had reached a pinnacle, not a pinnacle, but you wanted to, 
you knew there was more. You knew you could do even better. So there's a bit of a growth mindset angle. First 40 episodes, you were solo. But the podcast continues to evolve over time. What's been the big evolution for you as a podcast host within financial services? Yeah. Um, you know, in between the newsletter and the podcast, um, I started doing LinkedIn content, mm. um, mostly written words. Um, when I, I started that in 2015 and no, like no one in my industry was doing it. It was like, what are you doing? You know, um, I, I remember 2016, I went to a conference and I spoke on the, at the, it was an SBA lending conference, 300 people in Florida, Flagle. And I spoke about LinkedIn marketing and I did like, Hey, raise your hand. If you're on LinkedIn, 2% of the, of the room, um, we're using it for marketing. Everyone else was like, that's a job thing. You know, um, the next year I came back, I was talking about it again. Um, fast forward to today, it's extremely mainstream in our industry to be posting your wins on LinkedIn and all this LinkedIn marketing. So that was really the thing that kind of set me on this trajectory of creating content. And I started making a couple of videos and like, you know, around this time too, I did a couple of funny videos that, that took off some parody videos. And, um, so I, you know, I dabble in content. I, you get, you know, you start getting a little bit more into it. And then the podcast is a big project and I had no plan either, by the way. I mean, I had no plan. Um, and I wasn't fully consistent at first. Now we're very consistent, obviously, but um, it started as I'm going to record when I want to record and release it. Um, we added video around episode 40. Um, I I was editing the podcast myself after about four of the ones with video. I was not able to keep up with that at all. And I, I brought in some help. Um, my executive producer, Madison, still with us today. and we just went from the one-on-one -on -one, or just me that we, we call a solo episode. We went to the interview. Mm -hmm. I was interviewing a lot of videos. We ended up interviewing a lot of then heads of SBA departments. So a lot of the heads of the SBA departments within the banks, the top folks, um, you know, running our industry, um, were coming on as guests. We started doing some in-person content after COVID the production quality just, you know, went up at that point. And we, my, my favorite guest was we had the former head of the SBA on the podcast, which that was my, that was my favorite guest. Cause you know, she worked in the cabinet of, you know, for the president of the United States under the Obama administration. And she was on my podcast and that was like, that's when I feel I made it. Um, this season, we really wanted to switch things up again. So we just completely changed the format and we just keep doing that every time we feel comfortable, um, just to keep us growing. Yeah. And the doors that this has unlocked, it sounds like you're doing things now that you couldn't even really comprehend or perceive back then. I know that we were talking about books and the gap in the gain. 10X is easier than 2X um, by Dan and Ben as well. Dan Sullivan, Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Dr. Benjamin Hardy also writ has written a book, Be Your Future Self Now. I'm curious how much of your future self plays into the work that you're doing today in the present. It's like, are you operating from your future self? Cause I don't really see you necessarily operating from your past. How does that influence that perspective of the future self of what is possible versus well, this is what I've done. This is what I know you're continuously leaving that behind and letting go to continue to make space and room to grow moving forward into the future through the work that you, that, that you've been doing. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I've, I believe anything is possible. So, you know, life is short. Why not, you know, shoot for as high as you want to go. If that's your thing, you know, for me, it is, I, you know, it's just an intrinsic motivation to see my fullest potential in business and content, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep going. And yeah, so you're constantly, I'm, I love reading books. I'm always reading multiple books at once. And, um, you know, you're expanding your brain and it's just amazing that 
you know, we can do that. I mean, I grew up in a, you know, a, I don't know what you want to call it, lower middle class, we'll call it household. Um, you know, we had, there were some issues financially, um, went to college, um, you know, was just happy. I had a job. It paid me 28,000 a year plus commission. I was the happiest person in the world. I had two roommates. I was able to be self-sufficient and I felt rich and, you know, life, it's just like incremental, like going up and up. And that is a great feeling, um, to, to do that when you know that it's just when you put your mind to something, you're able to achieve it, right? There's nothing, there's nothing stopping you. And so I read the first book I read was Think and Grow Rich. Obviously everyone knows this book now, but it worked. I mean, I, you know, like I read it and I was just like, oh wow. Like, you know, nope. I did not think any of this would have been possible. So I don't know. It's just, it's crazy to even think about, but now my focus is on like some, I guess my, not my fear, but like sometimes you get into your grind and you're thinking about too short term. And so you aren't looking out enough. I'm probably guilty of this. And so you're not making those big moves to get you where you need to go faster. And it's hard to do because like, how do you skip those steps to get there? So right now I'm mostly focused on like what I need to do next year and the rest of the stuff I have kind of some ideas about, but I don't really, um, I'm not, you know, it's not something I'm like actively trying to do, um, right now. You mentioned Napoleon and think and grow rich. There's another one I recommend, uh, by a gentleman. His name is, uh, William Waddles, the science of getting rich. I believe it was written in 1910, 1911. Uh, also from wow. that period. Yes. I've been reading a lot of books from that time period. Um, uh, Orson, uh, sweat Martin, um, uh, has written prolifically around some of these subjects, the power of the mind. Um, as man thinketh is another one. Um, the writings of Florence Scovelshin um, as well. So if you're looking to continue to develop in that area, the power of thought, the power of, of the mind, it is something that I highly recommend that we all create space and time to do. And I think to your point, the danger is we get, get stuck in the here and the now that we don't create that space to think about where we've been where we're at and where we could even go next. And so what happens is we just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again without even questioning why we're doing it in the first place or continuing to do it for that matter. Yeah. yeah. The book, the book reading has been the most influential thing I've, I've done. I mean, my, my early boss, uh, going back to him again, um, by the way, he's on my, he's on my podcast now all the time. He's one of our panelists, um, in this new format, we kind of built a panel of contributors to kind of nice. make it like a, try to like make it like a real time with Bill Maher. Yeah. For S for SBA. Uh -huh. So we have a panel, they're rotating. So he's on that now. And um he yeah, he he was he forced me to read books because I wasn't a a reader at age 22. I was going out to the bars, but you know, but um he made me read all these books and it just completely opened up my mind. And I think that's such a key point when we're looking to continue to grow. It's it's learning. And it's seeing things different. It's one of the things I wrote about in my second book, Banking on Change. There are four steps to human transformation. Step number one is to see things differently. And that comes from reading. That comes from podcasts. That comes from videos. Um, it, it, it comes from conversations. That's one of the reasons, like, almost selfishly, I love this podcast because I'm always learning. And I'm, I'm, I'm my perspective gets challenged even from time to time. It's at this point. I take the Socratic approach to wisdom. I know I know nothing. Um, and there's always something there to learn, to grow, to be even better. When you look out within financial services, what do you see, particularly because your lens is on the SBA side, the commercial side, what do you see as the greatest threat, the greatest impediment to someone's growth potential? individually mm. 
the greatest threat to somebody's potential heart that's a good it's a good question um i don't know that i have an answer for you because i have not had that issue myself mm-hmm. so i would just be speculating i i feel like you can always grow you know whether it's like you get your if you're in a job and you're growing good and read books read listen to podcasts if you're not growing in your job and you're at a dead end um probably leave you know uh and keep growing so that's that's my answer <laughs> What what I see, because I see a, a macro view working with a lot of different banks and a lot of different credit unions, self-limiting beliefs, self-limiting beliefs that someone said something or we believe something and we stop, we stop trying, we stop learning, we stop experimenting, we stop exploring. And I think what I'm hearing and seeing with your story is you're continuously being curious. You're continuously being curious. And as a result, that's changing your perspective of what you're seeing, of what you're thinking, of what you're feeling. And as a result, you're continuously doing something different than what you've ever done before. And then the cycle continuously repeats itself. And so this is this upward spiral of continued growth. If you look, yeah. you know, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, it's, as you, as you say that it's kind of, it, it, it is getting the wheels turning. Cause I, I feel like it's a mental thing. I mean, I, sometimes you hear people complain or, you know, make excuses and I've never really done that. I, you know, I'm in the business of doing loans. You've got to deal with different people involved in doing this. And sometimes, you know, you have someone in the process who's not, um, as, motivated to get a deal done or whatever and you want to just blame that person when in reality i've always asked myself what i could do better to make this process better or this experience better for the customer Mm -hmm. um so just looking inward um and being cognizant of what you can control these are things i've done to um stay positive and keep growing and there's that mindset once again. You're 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 taking a negative situation or what could be perceived as perception, what could per- be perceived as a challenging situation. Have you ever read any of uh, Ryan Holiday's works? The obstacle is the way. By any mm-hmm. chance? I think that you you like to read at someone else to to put on your radar. And I know Audrey is probably creating a list of books to follow up with you. Yeah, we're gonna need a transcript. Uh, yeah, of this one. <laughs> um, but you're controlling what you can control, which is your response to the situation. And one of the the questions that I have is specifically based upon your experience. I've been hypothesizing, and I touched on this in Banking on Digital Growth. So my first book published all the way back in 2020. But my thought is becoming even more solidified that the individual brand of a leader, of a lender, of an advisor has the potential to be as influential, if not even more influential than the corporate brand. And that's a very scary proposition for I think a lot of traditional financial brand leaders. But that's the way of the world. That's that's just where things are headed. And a lot of it is because the individual brand or the the brand of an individual, we have the capabilities as you and I have today to influence the thinking of others. And it, when you distill down what, what is marketing, what is sales, what is leadership into one word, it is influence. For those that might be feeling uncomfortable right now, because it is a different perspective, it is a different way of seeing, of thinking, of feeling, of doing, what would you recommend to them to continue to elevate their perspective to say, you know what? Think, think and grow rich, right? You can look at it as a threat or we can see this as an opportunity 
because I know with where you're at today, you told me even that they're utilizing your content internally within the organization, which is a, it's great that there's a, there's a multiplication of value creation through the work that you're doing. hundred percent. I mean that now, you know, I have a lot to add on this topic because this is one I've actually thought about a lot more. Um, and I don't think it's where it's going. I think it's where it's been. Like, mm. why do you do business with bank X? Most of the time, it's because of that person in the branch that goes the extra mile. And if you hire a lender, um, you're hiring them for their relationships. And they are an influencer in their community. The only difference now is it's all online. Mm. And we can create content very affordably um, and and it's scalable. Yeah, That's really the big change. And my advice to the institutions, because um, you're right, the content's very powerful. I am using this podcast to generate business. I'm using my YouTube channel to generate business. I'm using these platforms to hire and attract talent and it's working. And because I work at True Lion, they're benefiting from this. Mm-hmm. So it's win-win all the way around. Um, and I'm very pleased how you know, welcoming they've been for what, I, you know, with regards to what I've been doing. I mean, they are promoting it on their LinkedIn channels. They're playing, apparently they're playing it on the TVs. I, I learned that today. In fact, I talked to the group today about the podcast, the whole commercial lending group. And, you know, that's very different than many other institutions approach to content where they try to silence you essentially because of their social media policy, essentially. Um, so my advice would be, that the heads of the institutions become content creators. And I know that sound, that may sound crazy to some, but you know, doing the content, it's about the person on camera and the head of the organization should be on camera. And someone I'll shout out Keith Costello at locality bank. He's great at that. Keith, is the CEO of locality. He puts out videos on LinkedIn, um, unfiltered, does not go through a marketing department. I'm pretty sure he's uploading that straight from his cell phone on the way to his uh, CrossFit classes. And um, tell you what, I, I, I ended up, I didn't know Keith at the time. I didn't know the bank at the time. They are in my market down here in South Florida. But I ended up transferring a large sum of money to his bank. Um, and and that was because his content inspired me to do business with his bank. I know Keith very well. Keith and I. I have, thought you would. Keith and I have gotten to, to hang out and we had bourbon on a train through Kentucky. I mean, like, and we've actually been trying to figure out how to get down there so I can get on his podcast. And you're right. I think Keith is a, is a great testament to what is possible but keith is just being keith right you know and and, and it, he's multi-dimensional some days it's about banking some days it's about what's going on in dc some days it's what's you know what was going on at crossfit some days it was who he was interviewing as an entrepreneur in the local community i don't know i've your, your point about if you're a leader, get comfortable being on camera. Get comfortable being a content creator. And this gets back to something that I have been talking about at macro levels, at conferences and events over the past couple of years, in small workshops. But the thing that keeps coming up time and time again, it's the self-limiting beliefs. Ray, that's great. That's good for you. Or Keith, that's great for Keith. I I can't do this. I believe you can because I'm one who was the shy kid in school, had a speech impediment, did speech therapy. In fact, I actually worked with a speech therapist back in 2019 again because I was having some issues. It was with my speech. 
not necessarily from a communication and articulation, but because I was starting to talk so much, the back of my neck was just killing me all the time. Fun fact, I had no idea that your tongue and your neck go hand in hand together. So I actually had a tongue tie. So at the age of like 38, I had my tongue clipped. And that was because I was working with the speech pathologist. It was like she was watching my communication. So even then, it's like having a coach, having someone who helps you see what you can't see in yourself can truly elevate your future and your future potential, which is where I know we talked about Dan was strategic coach. That's, that's why I've been involved in these programs over the years. When you look out within financial services, once again, coming back to the context of SBA lending, what percentage of lenders, leaders, BDOs, are doing what you're doing today. Because I think you said there's about a market of 20,000 or so. Oh, yeah, it's a very small number. Um, yeah, no, it's a very small number. It, that's just how it is. You know, people, uh, like, when it was almost just me, and, you know, one of the things we ended up doing was um, a BDO retreat. Great event. We started it about four years ago. We've mm -hmm. done... We're about to do our fourth in in uh, Scottsdale. Yeah. Um, it's basically the top SBA lenders from the or all around the country come together to share best practices, almost like a mastermind type of thing. And the first year, you know, we talked about the content. Everyone's like, "Well, you do the content," and I was like, "We can all do the content." You know, it's not just me. I don't own content for SBA. And now, um. Alan's doing content. Jared's doing content. Glenn's about to come online and do content. Um, uh, Greg started a TikTok. These are all people who have attended. Um, and so, yeah, they're coming online uh, more and more. But overwhelmingly still, people are afraid to get on camera. They're, they just won't pull the trigger. Even the ones that want to do it just won't pull the trigger. And I've been there. Um, I get it. But... You know, life's short, so hit record. Life's short, hit record. There's You could not wrap this conversation up with a better sound bite. Life's short, hit record. Memento Mori is my philosophy. Remember your death because it's too short. It's like what, what opportunities – might we never achieve because of the self-limiting beliefs, the fear, the doubt, the uncertainty. And by the way, I want to loop back around one more book for you. It's like become a book reference podcast on as a secondary. You have a book club? Um, I've done a book club. Uh, I don't have a book club personally, but I facilitated a couple of them in the past. Sounds uh, like you need a book club. We do need a book club. Audrey and I have talked about that. I mean, we, we actually have a sub episode called behind the cover of the books that Audrey and I have been reading and we'll, tie them back in perspective to financial services. But but your your point on what holds people back. Um, Napoleon Hill wrote another book, 1937, but it wasn't published until 2011. And not many people know this book. To me, I like, I think this book is far more powerful than Think and Grow Rich. The title of the book is Outwitting the Devil. If you haven't read it, highly highly recommend outwitting the devil because it's the power of fear and self-limiting beliefs that never allow us to achieve our full potential as individuals what napoleon hill did he put the devil on trial he got the devil to confess of how he controls us now is this a real devil is this a devil in napoleon hill's mind there's a lot of philosophy to it but I think they're very good questions that we must pause and ask and ponder. And when we do, we will always see something new in ourselves that can unlock new growth. Ray, I really appreciate you joining for this conversation today and sharing where you've been, where you're at. I can't wait to see where you're going to go next. 
um, as you continue along your journey of growth. What would be one thing that someone who is watching or listening can do next on their journey of growth so that they can move forward and make progress, something small that they can apply based upon everything that we've talked about here today? What would, what would be that one thing that they could do now? Well, sticking on the trend of personal branding, it doesn't have to be video. You can literally do anything. Um, just put some thought into it. Um, it could be a post that you do once a week. It could be just posting a photo of you on the weekends. It could be anything. Just get yourself out there. Because, you know, honestly, for the people listening here, you know, we're in essentially a commodity business, um, money for the most part. And personal branding is, in my opinion, the most effective way to decommoditize the commodity. Because now people are buying you and your brand and not just, you know, money, which obviously you can get anywhere. So just start small, start with one thing and be consistent about it. Start small, start with one thing, be consistent. Stack up little wins over time. Ray, what's the best way for someone to reach out, say hello, continue the conversation that we've started here today? How can they connect with you? I would point them to my LinkedIn. Just search for Ray Drew and I'm not hard to find. Connect with Ray, learn with Ray, grow with Ray. Ray, I appreciate you joining me for another episode of the Banking on Digital Growth Podcast. This, is, this has been a lot of fun today. Thanks for having me. And thanks, Paul, for uh, making the connection. Absolutely. Shout out, Paul Long. As always, and until next time, be well, do good, be the light.